I was going to start today in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, or maybe even 3. Uh, but I'm going to start, yeah, I was going to start in 1 Corinthians 3. I'm going to start by reading a few passages in chapter 1, well, one chapter, uh, one passage in chapter 1 and a few in chapter 2. We're going to look at a lot of scripture today, uh, but I think you're going to enjoy it. And when the more scripture we read, I think the easier it is for you to uh, determine whether I'm preaching scripturally. Amen. So let's start with this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he's writing. This is his, probably his second letter to the church at Corinth. Corinth was a Gentile church, a Gentile city, and the, the church in Corinth was uh, composed primarily of Gentile believers. You know Paul's pattern, at least I think you do if you read through the book of Acts. Uh, we see this pattern whenever he would go to a new city, was if there was a synagogue there, and there were uh, in many, if, uh, most if not all of the cities he visited, and he would go there first out of respect for his heritage, out of respect for the history of the word of God which came through the Jews, out of respect for the fact that Jesus was brought into the world through Adam's race. Uh, so he would go and deliver the message there. And uh, there, were always, there would always be a response it wasn't always a good response, but there would always be some Jews who would begin to follow Paul's teaching there, respond to the gospel. Uh, but many times uh, he experienced a degree of rejection from the Jews and would begin to uh, speak to the crowds of Gentiles. And uh, these congregations would grow. And of course, then he would be hounded by the Jewish Christians, the Judaizers, which were Jewish converts, would sort of chase him around or follow him and say, okay, now that you've accepted uh, our God, let's go back and make sure you get circumcised and, and do, follow the law and everything. And so Paul would kind of wrestle with that throughout his ministry. But all that to say, every, there, there are certain similarities. When you read through the epistles, when you read through Paul's letters to these various congregations, these very, in congregations in these various cities, you're going to see some similarities. You're going to see certain themes pop up. But there are also uh, some pretty significant distinctions about what the overall message is, his overall attitude concerning a congregation. Now, Paul spent a lot of time in Corinth. He had a lot invested in their future, in their welfare, in their spiritual maturity. And so there was a lot of correspondence, too. When he wasn't there, he would make sure that he tried to stay on top of things. And, of course, they didn't have email and telephones and everything back then. So everything was done by messenger and letter. And we see the references in the two letters we have that we call 1st and 2nd Corinthians are probably more like 2nd and 4th Corinthians. We just don't have the other two letters. I don't, mean, I don't think that's a necessarily a tragic loss. I believe God superintended the canon of Scripture, and these are the two letters we need for doctrine and correction, right, and training in righteousness. But we do realize, because these are two letters of significant length, we can sort of get an idea of what kind of congregation Corinth was, the Corinthian church was. So, uh, one of the things, first things we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, says this, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that's pretty encouraging stuff. What you're going to see almost immediately after this is that he's addressing, that there's a lot of, A, there's a lot of faith in that greeting. He's believing for the best and speaking the best. And he's also writing uh, sort of uh, ex post facto. After I've taught you a lot of stuff, after I've visited you, you have grown to a certain point. But they still are immature as he will specify. There's no reading between the lines once you get to chapter 3. But he does say this, that you fall sh short in no spiritual gift. Uh, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we read about the gifts of the Spirit. And as has been said many, many times from this pulpit, not just from me, 
the ability or the proclivity or the practice of, of operating in the spiritual gifts is not an indication of spiritual maturity. It does, it, an immature, an imma, as long as you're born again, as long as you're spirit-filled, you can operate and should even expect to operate in the spirit, spiritual gifts. Uh, that does not equal Christian maturity. Now, spiritually mature Christians should also operate in the spiritual gifts. And hopefully we do it more sensitively, more correctly, right? More properly. Uh, but the gifts themselves are not an indication of spiritual maturity. And this is one of the messages that Paul is really trying to get through to them, especially when we get into those later chapters, is you've got some work to do. You've got some growing up to do because of this spiritual maturity. And you're trying to cover up. You're trying to cover that up by flowing in the gifts. You're spending all this time in the service speaking in tongues over one another when you should be paying attention to this other stuff. He launches right here. He, I'm going to read it right now, but you can read ahead later on. You can read the rest of this chapter. He launches right into this whole thing about why are you arguing about who baptized you? You know, you're forming these little cliques where all of, belong to Jesus Christ. And you're arguing, I got baptized by Paul. I got baptized by Apollos and so on. Uh, and just really starts to slam them. But I want to skip ahead, in the interest of time, to chapter 2. And this is the part we've read, quite a, we've read a number of times fairly recently. But we'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 2. When I came to you... Well, let me read it in, the, in this. I'm, I've got two different versions here. And I, brethren, when I came to you, when I came to you, did not come with, the excellence, with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, for the umpteenth time in, in recent weeks and months, he's not saying that the only thing that matters is that Jesus was crucified. He's certainly not saying that's the only thing he knows. He's not even saying that's the only thing I taught you. He's saying, when I came to you, this was the only thing that mattered. Why? Because they weren't saved. They needed to know what their spiritual condition was before they could make a legitimate response to the gospel. Uh, somebody shout me down or wave something at me if, if I shared this, this particular illustration because if I did, it wasn't in my notes and I don't remember. But you remember when Paul was uh, engaging the crowds in the marketplace at Mars Hill when, when the philosophers would come and uh, they would debate and have the, in, in Athens there, and he would, uh, and he decided to take them on and he starts uh, preaching about the unknown God. You remember this story in Acts, what is it, 20, 21, 22, somewhere in there. Uh, he's on his way somewhere else and, just, and, and he's just waiting around, but he decides he's going to, since they're talking philosophy, they're talking religion, he'll join in. He starts preaching. He, he's a statue to an unknown, unknown God. And he says, this is the God I preach to you. And he starts to get their attention. But then he starts talking about the resurrection. And as soon as he mentions the resurrection, you had a whole chunk of the crowd said, ah, we don't want to hear any of this nonsense. And they start to walk away. Now, some stayed and heard, and a handful of them responded. What the uh, well-known missionary Don Richardson says in his superb book, Eternity in Their Hearts, is that Paul made a tactical error here. In that he started to speak about the resurrection without explaining why he had to die in the first place. And this is why people, whoa, what's this resurrection? It's almost like the resurrection out of the blue here. I don't know. That might be a harsh thing to say. But I think this is what Paul is doing here. I, before we start talking about the resurrection, I'm going to talk to you about Christ crucified. And wrapped up in that is, why Christ crucified? Why was he crucified? Because of you. Why? Because of your sin. Because of original sin. Because of your need for uh, that sacrifice. So, uh, but then he starts talking about, it's not human wisdom. Not the wisdom of men. 
Because if we just stop there and say, I was determined to know nothing uh, when I was with you, when I came to you, save Christ and him crucified. And if we just take that and say, and that's all we need to preach, because that's all Paul preached, that means you didn't read beyond the next few verses. Because right there in verse 6, same chapter, he says this. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What's he saying here? When I started, when I first came, it was Christ and him crucified. But I do have more to say to the spiritually mature. Mysteries of the kingdom. Skip down to verse 13. These things we also speak. Let me back up here. Because right sandwiched in between that is the very famous uh, passage where he, he, where he quotes. Uh, where he says, so, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the mind of man the things which the Lord has prepared for those who love him. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about the future. He's talking about God's plans, his kingdom on the earth. And then in verse 13, he says, still in chapter 2, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, I'm reading out of the New King James Version. And there are different, if you look, look at that passage, for instance, in the NIV, it says this, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Uh, most of you know this rule, and depending on the, not just the translation you have, but the version, the publisher, the way it's printed, and you, you read the old King James, and, and quite often there's a word in italics. That means that word is not translated from anything that's in the original Greek, in this case, Greek. Uh, from the original languages. It's something that is inserted by the translators for the sake of clarity. And it's usually right on. But it's not like, well, they mistranslated that word. No, they just put a word in there. But they had the respect for the integrity of the scriptures to put it in italics to let you know this is a, 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 a translational aid. It's not part of the original text. And here, it basically says comparing spiritual with spiritual or spiritual things with spiritual. There's like a blank. Spiritual things with what? Other spiritual things? Uh, explaining spiritual things with spiritual words. That's a pretty good one. Here's what it says uh, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Uh, beginning in verse 12. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, so that we may understand what has been freely given to us by God. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual things to spiritual people. I like that. And here's why I think it's right. Because the very next verse says this. But the unbeliever does not welcome what comes from God's spirit. Because it is foolishness to him. He is not able to understand it since it is evaluated spiritually. Going back to the New King James. We'll pick that up and read it again. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Do you see how that flows? If we're talking about evaluating spiritual things or discussing spiritual or explaining spiritual things to spiritual people, that's what makes the most sense if the next thing out of, out of his pen is, but natural man, unspiritual people, the unbeliever, the unsaved, the unconverted, doesn't receive the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, uh, as I mentioned, or as we were talking about in men's prayer yesterday, if you just take that phrase, we have the mind of Christ, uh, you can very quickly see how this could lead into error or outright heresy. Bible says right there, we have the mind of Christ. That means I know everything God knows. That means I know everything Jesus knows. Uh, I, I, I think just as clearly and see just as perfectly as he does. That's not what this verse is saying at all. 
It's saying that because of the finished work of Christ and the fact that I am in Christ, I, something has happened to me. The new birth isn't just me making a statement or a commitment. It's something real that happens to me, a reborn spirit that is able to understand spiritual wisdom. I still have to be taught it. I still have to learn it. But Paul's saying that the, that the difference here, the gulf, is vaster than we imagine. He says the natural man, the unspiritual man, is unable. He can't even grasp these things. That it's foolishness to him. Not just because he disagrees with it. Not just because he, is so, uh, uh, he so desires to stay in his sinful path that he, he calls it nonsense. These things are spiritually understood. I want you to think about that. The very fact that you can grasp spiritual truths is an outworking of the very power, power of God in your life. You're looking for miracles. You're looking for a sign. What, how do I even, is God working in my life? Do you understand spiritual truths? I'm not saying you know it all. But if what we've talked about this morning makes sense to you, it's because you, are, you have a, a, a spiritual element that you are growing spiritually. This is the power of God. It's the new birth. It's the new man that makes that possible. This is, I can't overstate the importance of this. But look at this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. Now again, notice this. He's not calling them unsaved. He's calling them babies. Newborn Christians. Except some of them aren't newborn. But they're still acting newborn. They aren't growing up. They're not maturing. What's he say? For you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? And he's already talked about this earlier in the letter, as I mentioned in chapter 1. I love that. And that word mere, by the way, is one of those italicized words, but I think it's a perfect way of clarifying what he's saying. So if you read it, so are you not behaving like men? Well, what are we? If we're not men and women, well, we are something else. We're born again. We're spiritual men and women. But when we act like this, when there are these divisions and envy and strife and all the jealousies, we're, we're behaving like nothing more than men. And Paul is saying we're more than that. One of the coolest t-shirts. I used to love Christian t-shirts, man. I still like them. Uh, but man, back in high school, I think it was while we were still down in Tulsa, uh, while mom and dad were at Raymond, there was a guy wearing a t-shirt that said in big bold letters, I am not a mere man. And I love that. I'm not a mere man. I'm so much more. And we need to think about ourselves in those terms. I'm just a man. I'm just a woman. What's that, what was that song? Uh, one day at a time. I'm just a woman. No, you're not. If you're, if you're born again, you're not. You're not a mere woman. If you're born again, you're not a mere man. You are something else. You are something much bigger, much more powerful than you realize. Still in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, go down to verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can, be, uh, can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, going back to what did we start with? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, 
he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Wow. This is as close as we're going to get today. I'm not done. This is as close as we're going to get today to the tough stuff that we'll be talking about next week, which is don't kid yourselves about what's important. This passage is talking about, it's, a, it's making an assumption here that if you are a born again man or woman, that you will be doing work that you will be adding to this building that Paul, you know, Paul talked about. When I, when it, it's just, it, look, this is the work, your God's field. I came out here with my commission from God, and I'm building something here. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And you come along, and you're going to add to this, uh, and you're going to build something. Uh, some of the stuff you're doing, some of the works you're doing uh, is good stuff. And it could, be, it could be, imagine building a building out of gold and silver and precious stones. You set that on fire, you know what's going to be left? Gold, silver, and precious stones. This is a sort of a representation of what you have left in the day. What's the day? The day of accountability. The day we stand before God and give an accounting for what we did with what he gave us. He gives us gifts and he gives us a mission. He gives us a mission and he gives us gifts to accomplish that mission and do everything he's called us to do. And then we stand before him and say, here's what I did. He's like, let's check it out. Kahoosh! Here comes the fire. What's left? Wow, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Here's your reward. Now, if we build on it with junk, notice he's not talking here about sin. He's talking about the work that we at least try to do. But if it's bad, if it's bad doctrine, if it's lazy work, if it doesn't profit the kingdom, if it doesn't grow us up, it's like wood, hay, and stubble. Kahoosh! No, that fire is not the fire of hell. It's like, wow, you still confessed Christ, you're still a believer, and you're in heaven, praise the Lord. But it's not what I would call an abundant entrance into the kingdom. Be careful how you build on the doctrine that you receive. There are too many ministers. And listen, uh, we, again, we've got an excellent one coming in in a few weeks. An occupational minister who is called to go from church to church, state to state, country to country, and clarify the teachings of Scripture. Make doctrine easy to receive and easy to explain. Training other believers. And thank God for the itinerant ministers, they used to be the superstars. You know, everybody wanted to be a, a traveling minister instead of a pastor. And sometimes they have a tough row to hoe now because there are so many excellent teaching churches. There maybe isn't as much of a felt need for the traveling minister when I still think, a traveling teacher especially, when I still think it's an excellent ministry uh, when God has called them to do it uh, because different voices and different experiences bring uh, different levels of clarity and understanding. The problem is, this is why I even brought it up, is there are, uh, as you know, if you pay attention uh, to Christendom and Christian teachings and TV and other, uh, other uh, uh, media, is there sadly no shortage of ministers who, in order to maintain a certain visibility, fame even, in order to stay in the game, they feel like they've got to constantly be coming up with some new revelation, some new truth, something exciting that nobody's ever heard before. You know what I'm talking about? This is wood, hay, and stubble in my opinion. You're not building on this solid foundation with solid, you're building on it with speculative stuff and it's not going to last. This is, uh, you know, we had uh, another superb, uh, world-famous, uh, and rightly so, world-renowned Bible teacher in here last year, a guy by the name of Bob Yandian. Uh, and I remember telling you how excited I was to have him in. And I, I, I was kind of getting the impression that, like, yeah, I'll take your word for it for now. But after he left, 
I can't tell you how many people came up and said, now I know why you were so excited to have him in here. And my favorite thing about Bob Yandian, and I know most of you remember me saying it, but I'm going to say it again, is I can remember sitting in his congregation week after week after week, sometimes breathless with just how amazed I was at what I was hearing. But it wasn't the kind of thing of, wow, that's the most mind-boggling new concept I've ever heard. It was like he taught it in a way and so full of the Spirit that when it hit you, you're like, well, yes, of course. Of course, that truth is right there in the Bible. All he had to do was just say a few words to reveal that. And that's the kind of impact a good Bible teaching should have on you. Anyway, uh, here's what I want to, and, and maybe I will, maybe I'll get a little bit closer to the fire today before we get into next week. Uh, when we, that we are going to stand before Jesus with our life behind us. And he's going to say, here's what I gave you. And here's what I gave you to do. And your eternal reward is going to be based on what's left when I set it on fire. Do you think that maybe there might be one or two of us in this room, in light of the fact that on the other side of this life, and let's say everything goes right and you live to be 120 years old, What's on the other side of this life is eternity. Do you think there might be, maybe a handful, maybe as many as five of us in here who have perhaps invested way too much of our time, our talents, our energy, our resources in how good we can make this life and maybe not paid much, as much of attention in investing in what's next? How many of you think there might be at least five people in a crowd this size? I think most of us. But it's sobering because this is a real moment we're going to, we're going to face. Well, let's leave that there for now and look at one last passage of Scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 5. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. Let me stop right there. We hear the word election and sometimes we get tripped up. Make your call and election sure. He said, do all these things to make your call and election sure. Make sure you're saved. That's not what he's saying. He's saying these things need to characterize you so that nobody else has any doubt who you are. Make your call and election sure that, and, and obvious might be a better word there to everybody else. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't say that the only way you will ever go to heaven is if you abound in these things. Paul made it very clear in what we just read about building on that foundation Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble is tested by fire. And if it's, if it's all burned up, hey, guess what? At least you'll be saved. But it's, you're going you're gonna to show up smelling like smoke. And Peter here, again, is not saying, oh, the only way you're going to make it to heaven is to abound in all of these things that I just said. No, he's saying if you abound in these things, then your entrance into heaven will be an abundant entrance. 
it'll be exciting. It, you'll be, you, you will thank God for everything that you gave up, everything that you invested in eternity, even if it costs you a moment down here, you are, every uh, shadow of regret will disappear. As the trumpets blast and you hear the applause of heaven, there's somebody who did it right. There's somebody who is eternity minded. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But we've got to make that decision. We have to desire to abound in these things. Please, please, please. If you missed something, I, I hope this, I'm wrapping this up. I don't know if I'm wrapping it enough. Might as well, uh, praise the worship team. You can slowly make your way up here. Uh, I want you to have this message as a foundation for next week. Next week's Again, a little harder to hear. I'm not talking about, boy, you know, you uh, used to read stories about Jonathan Edwards when he would come preach. Was it Edwards? Preach sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, and he would, he would come and, and sometimes, uh, some descriptions said that he would actually just read his sermons. Uh, I think that has been overdone. I've, I've spoken to a historian who, who uh, was an expert on Edwards uh, who said that that was, it wasn't so much that he got up there in a monotone, but he wasn't one of these, ha, ah! he didn't, uh, you know, scream and holler and stuff, but he would, he would just deliver a very straightforward message on salvation. But the people in the congregation would be clinging to the pillars of the church because they could feel themselves slipping into hell. Uh, this is, that's not what I'm talking about next week. It's not going to be something like that. I mean, if the Holy Spirit moves that way, that moves that way, that's one thing. But it's going to be a little more challenging a little more concrete when it comes to that challenge. Uh, and I will back it up with scripture, and you need to hear it. But make sure you have this one as, as, as a uh, foundation. The other thing I wanted to point out was, uh, let me find it, because I don't think I put it in my notes. It just sort of dawned on me. Let me make sure, make sure I didn't skip something in my notes. Uh, when he's talking about the foolishness, <sighs> According to God's grace given to me, I'm a testament of what he would do in God's temple. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, I just didn't go far enough. Still in chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 18. Let no one, and I'm reading now out of the uh, Holman Christian Standard Bible again. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. What do you think about that? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Let him become a fool. If anyone thinks he's wise, let him become a fool. Let me tell you what that means. Let me tell you what I think it means. Let me tell you what I'm convinced it means. It doesn't mean become an idiot. It doesn't mean education is bad. It doesn't mean throw away what knowledge you have. It means if you are unsaved, there are people who have. He doesn't deny that the wisdom of the world exists. He's saying that the wisdom of the world isn't enough to comprehend the wisdom of the Spirit. So when a, even a wise person comes to Christ, the tendency is when they finally step out in faith and embrace the realities of the Spirit world, the tendency is, I understand all that stuff now. Yep. There is nothing more irritating to a mature believer, and since we're mature believers, we're good at tempering our irritation or hiding our irritation, but I think most of us know this. There's very few, there are very few things that are more irritating to a spiritually mature person than a novice Christian who acts like they know it all. None of us started out knowing it all. When he's saying here, let the wise become foolish, he's saying humble yourself. You're coming into a whole new world. You don't know everything, so don't act like you know everything. Come to him as if you were a fool and say, fill me, teach me, make me wise. Because the wisdom you acquired in the world will avail nothing in terms of spiritual maturity. And all the fools said, <laughs> you don't know what to do. This is a faith church, right? I'm not going to confess to being a fool. Stand up with me, please. All the spiritually wise said, amen. Praise the Lord. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, I want to start, start the finish. 
start the ending of this service, as I always do, making the most important invitation I can possibly make, which is, you know, we've talked a lot today about there is a stark difference between the natural man and the spiritual man, the unsaved man and the saved man, the dead man and the born-again man. And when I say man, I'm using that generically. I mean human. And that difference, there's a lot. There's a lot of difference. And what Paul was writing about is the difference that we see day to day in our experience in the kingdom. But the biggest, by far, the biggest difference is where you're going to spend eternity, which he also talks about. There's really a heaven and really a hell. And the decisions we make today affect, first of all, where we're going, heaven or hell. Also affects, if we're going to heaven, is it going to be an abundant, ent abundant entrance? Or are we going to be carrying nothing but ashes? Got to make some decisions. So the first decision is this. Do you need to look at that cross and say, yeah, you know what? I can't save myself. I am a sinner. I was born a sinner. I was conceived in sin. That's what the Bible says. Can't get away from that. Can't save yourself. Can't fix it. Jesus came to fix it for you. You say, well, I didn't ask him to do that. He did it anyway. He loves you. He wants to make this as easy as possible for you. Thank God he doesn't come up to us one by one and say, all right, now I'm ready to die for you. Do you want me to? I want to go through that again. He said, I did it. I did it once and for all for everybody. All you got to do is accept it. Do you need to accept it? Do you need to confess him as your Lord so that he becomes your Savior? Most important decision by far than any other decision you'll make in your life. Second is this. You say, well, I've made that confession of faith. <sighs> wow, we please come next week. Please come next week. I don't want you to come here worried about questioning your salvation. But you'll question somebody's salvation before the service is over next week. I'm not talking about somebody specific. <laughs> I'm talking about oh, somebody who's like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, no, this kind of makes sense. Let's be like what Peter encouraged us to be there. Let's make our calling and election sure. If you're looking and say, you know what? I've never really doubted that I believed. But come to think of it, I'd have never really given anybody else a reason to believe I'm a Christian. You need to. It's what we're here for. Maybe you need to recommit yourself. I'm not just talking about coming up and saying, I'm sorry, I blew it, I'll do better. I'm talking about in your heart, whether you come up here or not, don't leave without saying, I would say it like this almost, God, sometimes I forget who I am. And I don't want to forget who I am. Because you paid too much to make me who I am. I want you to get what you paid for. So I want to live like you've called me to live. And I can only do that in your power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And let me be your man, your person, your woman, your child. You need to make that decision today. Now's your moment. This has all just been, uh, you guys have looked engaged while we've been talking about this. And I'm not saying if nobody comes up here, it's a waste of time. But if you need to make a change and you don't make it, then what have we done for the last hour? We're here to support one another and encourage one another and challenge one another and hold one another accountable because we love each other, right? We're family. It's what we do. We want the best. I want the best for you. You should want the best for each other and you should want the best for me. So I'm going to pray. And when I'm done praying, if you need to make a decision, make it. If you want to give your heart to Christ for the first time, I urge you to come up here and at least let me pray that prayer with you. I want to celebrate with you. I want to acknowledge you. It's an, important, it's an important thing to do publicly at some point anyway. You might as well do it right off the bat. If you want to make that recommitment, you can kneel at the altar. I'd be happy to pray with you for that too. But if you need to make that decision, don't wait another day. It's not about, oh gosh, I've always known I need to make it, but I just don't know if I want to make it today. Yeah, you want to make it today. Listen, life is short. Young people think, well, I got all the time in the world. Again, maybe if everything goes right, nothing's going to happen to you. You're never going to get sick. You're never going to have an accident. What if Jesus comes back tomorrow? 
That shortens the time considerably to get things right, doesn't it? So let's get them right today. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us enough to record the hard truth, the hard letters, the hard advice, the challenges, not just the encouragement. And Lord, help your word sink in and touch us where we need to be touched. Wake us up where we need to be uh, awoken. And light a fire under us, Lord, where we're cold. Father, I pray, and I know it's the, the prayer of every believer in this room, that if there's anybody in here who has not been born again, who has not made Jesus Christ their Lord, has not come to know you as a saving Father through the finished work of Jesus Christ, that your Holy Spirit would do what only he can and convict the sinner of their need for that conversion, for that saving experience. Grant them the wisdom to, to recognize the peril that they are in. Grant them the humility to reach out to the only way of salvation. And grant them the boldness to do it today. In Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that you, that you also speak to us, everybody in this room. Because there, almost everybody in this room, I believe, has made that decision. Is in that relationship with you. But that you would shake them, Lord. Wake them. Us. Lord, and impress upon us the urgency of the hour and just how real it's going to be to stand before you and give an account for everything that you've given us to do and everything you've given us to do it with. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you come.